Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to GW Institute for Korean Studies, or GWIX. I'm Yeonho Kim, Associate Director of GWIX. Uh, thank you for joining our Korea Policy Forum. And today's forum is uh, co-sponsored by the East Asia National Resource Center at GW and the Institute for Far Eastern Studies at Gyeongnam University in South Korea. And for your information, uh, we are providing a simultaneous interpretation service today. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, there is the interpretation icon uh, at the far right, uh, right next to the uh, record button. Uh, you can choose either Korean or English. Uh, with that, uh, let me turn it over to Jisoo Kim, director of uh, GWIX, and Kwan Se Lee, director of the Institute for Far Eastern Studies for opening remarks. Jisoo? Thank you, Yano. Um, uh, we have been preparing this series of events related to next week's Biden Moon Summit uh, on May 21st. So the, uh, we had previous uh, KPF or Korea Policy Forum event that was held on April 26th. We had Congressman Andy Kim who talked about US-ROK relations, challenges and opportunities under the Biden administration. Today we'll be covering Biden's North Korea policy and US-ROK relations. And next Monday on the 17th, we will be discussing uh, multilateral cooperation in Northeast Asia in the Biden era. So um, I would like to uh, just mention that our Korea Policy Forum is made possible by the generous grant from the KDI School of Public Policy and Management. I would like to first thank Director Kwan Se Lee for supporting the Institute's co-sponsorship. Also, thanks to Professor Che Woo Chung and Associate Director of GWC Yono Kim for inviting distinguished speakers today. Professor Chung was responsible for speakers from Korea and Associate Director Kim was responsible for speakers from the US. So thank you all for your hard work. So for the first panel, uh, we have US ROK relations. We um, have two honorable speakers. We are so privileged to have them with us today. President of the University of North Korean Studies, An Oh Young. Um, he was also ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the US from 2013 to 17. And when he was in Washington, he gave his congratulatory remarks at the inaugural ceremony of the GW Institute for Korean Studies when our institute was first established back in two, January 2017. So we are so honored to have him back as our panelist today. Um, I, would, I would like to also thank Ambassador Kathy Stevens, who is the current president and CEO of the Korea Economic Institute of America for being with us today and always showing her support for our events. She has given congratulatory remarks at our HMS colloquium and gave her lecture to our participants to, uh, of the North Korea program. Thanks for being with us today to share your expertise on the US ROK relations. Uh, for uh, our next panel, US-North uh, Korea relations, I would like to thank President and CEO of the Maureen and uh, Mike uh, Mansfield Foundation, um, uh, Frank Januzzi. A, uh, he has been also uh, very much supporting our Korea Policy Forum, and this is his second panel participating uh, in our event this academic year, so thanks for your support. Thanks to Professor Chung Chul Lee at uh, Seoul National University. I know he has done an extensive research on North Korea, and we are so privileged to hear, from, uh, hear his views today. For our final uh, panel, Inter-Korean Relations, I think there's no other better speaker to hear from. So grateful to have former Minister of Unification, Eun Chul Kim. He's currently chairman of the board of uh, the Korea Peace Forum and a professor of the Department of Korea Unification at Inje University. Very much look forward to hearing from him. Finally, but not least, I would like to thank my colleague, Celeste Arrington. Uh, she's Korea Foundation Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs for her participation. Um, I would like to, well, actually, I'd like to share um, good news about her. Just yesterday, um, it was announced that she received the GW's Early Career Scholar Award. Congratulations again, Celeste. I look forward to hearing your views as well. Um, as a number of RSVPs show, we received almost 400, um, counting both US and uh, South Korea side. Our audiences are eager to hear from our panelists. Um, and we know that the Biden administration has finalized its North Korea policy review, and we expect to see coordinated approach to North Korea among the allies and friends in the coming months. I hope today's webinar will be a very informative discussion on how, we'll be, uh, how that will be played out. I will now turn it over to Director Kwan Se Lee to give his remarks. Thank you, Jisoo. Uh, Director Lee. 안녕하십니까? 경남대 
경남대 극동문제연구소장 이관. I am Lee Kwan Se, who is the director of the Institute for the Far Eastern Studies of the Gyeongnam University. And today, along with my institute and the GWIX, we are currently having this event so that we can discuss the Korean policy, especially the Biden administration's policy and the inter-Korean relations. I believe this is truly meaningful. GWIX and my institute have been studying the society economies of North Korea from the fundamental and the long-term perspective. We have been studying a lot about those topics, especially the GWIX has contributed to the Korean studies and it has become the hub about the Korean studies. The North Korean policy review has been finalized by the Biden administration and we are expecting the new waves of the change. And in the next week, on the 21st of the May, there will be the summit meeting between the US and South Korea. I believe the summit meeting will be a turning point for the peace on the Korean Peninsula. That's going to be a really important meeting. Under this juncture, we have the best experts from Korea and the US so that we can forecast what is going to unfold. I believe this is truly important and meaningful. I sincerely hope that you can present a good idea so that we can contribute to the peace on the Korean Peninsula and the better relations. Once again, I would like to thank all the experts who are gathered here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director Lee. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, le let me uh, start the first panel on the us rock relations. Uh, we are lucky to have two distinguished speakers, as uh, Jisoo uh, introduced. Ambassador uh, Ho Young An um, is president of the U University of North Korean Studies. He served as the Republic of Korea's ambassador to the United States. Deputy Minister for Trade at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador to the European Union and Belgium, and the first Vice um, Foreign Minister. Our next speaker is Ambassador Kathleen, speaker, uh, Kathleen Stevens, uh, who is President and CEO of the uh, Korea Economic Institute of uh, America, KEI. She served as a US Ambassador to the Republic of Korea, under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, and National Security Council Director for European Affairs at the Clinton White House. Uh, it's pretty much mouthful when you, <laughs> when you are inviting uh, prominent speakers like uh, both of them. Uh, with that, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Ambassador An. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I should be be beginning by thanking the organizers in the sense that, well, I went, I, I just looked at the, the list of participants, panelists, and I came, came to find that why so many of them are such good friends of mine. So thank you so much for, for organizing this seminar. And as my uh, colleague, Dr. Panseli said, and in one week's time, then of course, there will be meeting between uh, President Moon and the President Biden. And I'm pretty sure there are at least three issues that they, they are going to discuss be, between two of them. The first issue, of course, as Dr. Lee already said, new North Korean policy of the United States. And in comparison with the previous plans, then uh, my impression is that where well, much focus is being placed upon diplomacy, and that, that that's a good thing. But at the same time, I was listening to President Biden, when he addressed the joint session of uh, Congress on April 28th, and then he said he is going to address this issue through diplomacy and stone deterrence. And I said to myself that, in fact, is a very interesting combination of uh, two different concepts, diplomacy and stone deterrence. And then at the same time, I thought that that's the right balance because, well, there's a saying in the United States, which is, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So I think when the two presidents meet, I very much hope how to make the best of this offer that President Biden is making, but at the same time, how to prepare for 
the far more likely scenario where the, uh, the North Korea would continue to develop its nuclear weapons and, and missiles. Moving on to the second issue, which I'm pretty sure, again, our two presidents will be addressing, that will be uh, several, say, geopolitical issues in Northeast Asia. And top on the list, of course, would be where Korea should be posi positioning itself between United States and uh, China. And there are, there are certain, certain number of people in my own country who are thinking that, well, we should be keeping our cars to ourselves and then try to play them one by one, depending upon the situation. And then that, in fact, that approach, in fact, is being called as something called strategic ambiguity. And whenever I hear that, I tell myself, well, that wouldn't, wouldn't work too well. Why? Because I think that will deepen the impression that Korea is the weakest link in the network of US alliance in Asia Pacific. And then that way, I think it will lead to the situation where Korea, in fact, would be losing credibility, both with the United States and China. So, so whenever I hear this expression, that is to say strategic ambiguity, I, I tell myself that, in fact, is not the way to go. In my mind, it should be strategic clarity rather than ambiguity. And then still on, in the same context, that is to say important geopolitical issues, which our two presidents should be addressing. Then, of course, uh, how to further strengthen the trilateral partnership among Korea, United States, and Japan. That, in my mind, should be at the top of the list. Moving on to my third and last issue, that is, uh, that is uh, what I would call, say, new frontier issues. What I mean by new frontier issues is there are a large number of issues which, between Korea and the United, United States, we should be worked further on in order to further widen and deepen this alliance relationship between Korea and United States, like pandemic, like climate change, like technology, like supply chain, like standard of technology, like air and space, like cyberspace. The list goes on and on and on. And then in my mind, there, there's so much we can do between our two countries, between Korea and the United States, because they're important issues in the first place. But at the same time, by working together, then of course we can further expand, broaden and deepen the alliance between Korea and the United States. And not only bilaterally, but also among like-minded countries. And then when you talk about the like-minded countries, then of course there is, there is an uh, organization or a grouping of countries, which is uh, emerging more and more important, which is called Quad. Quad is not a treaty body. Well, in fact, it is, is, is a group of countries, like-minded countries working together on issues of common interest. And then as I already told you, pandemic, climate change, technology, they in fact are the issues being addressed by Quad. And I think it will be, again, a very appropriate topic for our two presidents when they meet next week. So I, I talked about, say, uh, North Korean policy, talked about geopolitical issues, talked about new frontier issues, and then whatever the issues may be, I think what is important is two presidents must take best of advantage of this opportunity to strengthen trust between the two countries because alliance wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to move forward, forward without trust. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador An. I remember when uh, Ambassador An uh, was in Washington as the ambassador, uh, Korean ambassador to the uh, United States. He liked to have three uh, talking points whenever he, uh, you know, delivered the uh, address. Today, uh, he uh, is also three po uh, talking points, and uh, I, uh, I really uh, appreciate your succinct and insightful, uh, you know, comments. So let me turn it over to Ambassador Stevens. Well, thank you, Yonho, and, and greetings to everyone. Uh, I too want to uh, join Ambassador An in thanking the organizers uh, of this program. It's really terrific to see uh, so many uh, friends and familiar faces, uh, and uh, I hope you're all well. And it's, of course, always a pleasure to join Ambassador An, uh, who has contributed so much to USROK relations over the years and uh, to, to, to follow, although to follow him is a little bit of a challenge because he's already covered a lot of the things that I would have said. So I, first of all, I would say I'm in broad agreement with him 
Um, I too am, uh, think it's, it's, it's good to start this, uh, this, this conversation this morning by talking about the US-South Korea relationship, not only because there's going to be a, a summit in exactly one week's time in Washington, DC, and indeed it is the only the second in-person summit uh, back in the old days, that was the only kind of summit there was, was in person. Otherwise, it was called a telephone call. But anyway, uh, the, only the second in-person summit for President Biden uh, with uh, President Moon next week, uh, following, of course, his earlier summit uh, last month with Prime Minister Suga of Japan. Um, but I think the reason it's, it's good to start this conversation where we're going to focus on the challenges of the Korean Peninsula and North Korea, uh, the unfinished business there, is because um, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, in my view, uh, the US's most important interest on the Korean Peninsula is indeed our very deep alliance with the United States, uh, with, with, with South Korea. And when I use the word alliance, I don't simply mean the security military alliance, but the very, very broad and deep relationship we have across a whole range of issues that again, Ambassador Ahn alluded to, and which become, have become even more important in this period of crisis that we've been in, both economically and in terms of many other issues. And I also think for, for a Korean president, if I may say, my observation has been whether it's a, a, a president from the uh, uh, one side of the political spectrum or the other, uh, while certainly it's always a, a national task and, and uh, uh, the highest priority to try to make progress on uh, a permanent peace and reconciliation and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, it's equally important to manage and nurture that very, very important relationship with the United States and to demonstrate that a Korean president can do both. So I would say that I see the, the summit uh, in, in that light. Uh, and I also see the summit in the light of, of uh, the overhang, if you like, not only of the current crisis we're in and still in and coming out of, I hope, uh, but also of the, the new and not very pleasant normal of US-China relations, of much heightened tensions and competition. And I think sometimes in Washington, it's not fully appreciated um, the, the, the kind of very difficult position that puts in particular South Korea in, but, but of course many other friends and partners uh, in the region and indeed in the world. And the other overhang of course is, is, and most of my South Korean friends are too polite to talk about it, but some worries about how, how the United States is emerging from its own period of political crisis, uh, whether or not uh, if uh, the U.S. is going to uh, be more consistent, more reliable going forward, and how it will uh, adapt to uh, changing circumstances, including uh, greater Chinese assertiveness and even aggr uh, aggression. So with that context, I would see the main agenda, and I've uh, pretty much the same as Ambassador on. I'll start with so, the not the North Korea issues. Um, I think first and foremost, they, they're going to want to demonstrate that the alliance is sound and strong. That's the number one goal of this. Um, and, you know, there have been some good steps in the past, uh, in the first hundred days of President Biden uh, resolving the special measures agreement, uh, having the uh, travel of Secretary Blinken and Austin to Seoul as well as Tokyo, um, and uh, uh, sending a, a strong message of that commitment uh, to placing alliances in the highest priority category. Uh, I, 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 it's my impression, and again, I'd be interested in my Korean colleagues' uh, view on this, that uh, it's going to be important for President Moon to see if there's some, something, something to be done in terms of cooperation uh, with respect to where we are on, on the pandemic. And in that sense, it's where each of our countries has had certain strengths and weaknesses, shall we say, and uh, uh, South Korea has demonstrated many strengths, but I know that there's an eagerness to cooperate on vaccines. Uh, I don't know what's possible, but I certainly get the sense that there is a discussion about that. And another more specifically in those global issues is of course, uh, supply chains and especially semiconductors. I mean, I, May 20th is going to be what is being called, I guess, the second semiconductor summit. I don't know how you, how, how you have a semiconductor summit and well, you do it virtually, but uh, it, it, with it, seriously, it is a, an important issue and one of which an example of the kind of area where of course the US and ROK can cooperate, but it's not easy either. <laughs> yeah, these are complicated issues too. So um, one more th 
thing of then about how you do it and how we cooperate. And you know, the other watchword of the Biden administration has been multilateralism. One has been alliances, that's good, we like that. Multilateralism, you know, we kind of like that too. We former diplomats, I think South Korea is a very able middle, middle power has always been attracted to multilateralism, but there's different kinds of multilateralism. And as has already been alluded to, I think this, this notion of what the quad is has caused understandably a little bit of surprise and discomfort in Korea, especially when we haven't had the kinds of communications we'd normally have. The Biden administration doubled down. Uh, those are the words of a White House official, doubled down on the quad approach of the Trump administration. So there's, there's continuity in some of this too. Um, and, uh, and that has posed some questions for Korea. I think some of that's been kind of cleared up, but I agree with Ambassador On this is being an important uh, moment when the two presidents can, uh, can talk about uh, uh, that sort of regional cooperation and, and, and how each side sees it and, and where, uh, where, where South Korea fits in, uh, where the US fits in, in terms of, of what its aims are. And within that, of course, is also uh, uh, implicit and, and explicit the relationship between South Korea and Japan. Clearly it's a very high uh, priority for the Biden administration. They've made no secret of this to try to help improve that relationship. Easier said than done, uh, but uh, it's uh, going to remain, I think a very, very uh, important concern uh, in the White House and in the Biden administration. And finally on the North Korea policy review, um, I think it's interesting that, you know, we've all seen, <laughs> a lot of us have been around long enough. We've seen a lot of policy reviews on North Korea um, it, you know, now it's not only in the context of North Korea's larger nuclear program, its economic difficulties and the overall situation uh, in, in the DPRK, but also these much more important, I would say, regional dynamics uh, in play that have changed a great deal uh, over the last several years. Uh, I would point to the, I, I actually welcome the fact that the Biden uh, policy review outline is there, but it's not, as we sometimes say, cast in stone. It's, it's kind of been put out there as a framework. And uh, one, one pillar of that, uh, of that framework uh, is uh, the, uh, the indication that the Biden administration sees the Singapore statement as something that can be built on. Uh, I know that's something that's been important uh, uh, to the Moon administration. I think it will, will provide a, a basis for a, a discussion, not only between the two presidents, but of course, between their staffs going forward, because it does seem to me, and this is my final thought, the one big challenge is not a new challenge, but how do you get the DPRK to the table? Yes, we want to do diplomacy, but how do you get to the table? And clearly, uh, both Seoul and Washington, and perhaps some other countries too, uh, have a very uh, important uh, uh, role to play in that, but we have to do it uh, together. Thank you, Ambassador Stevens. Uh, since we, we have uh, uh, two more uh, uh, sessions about uh, the North Korea, Biden's North Korea policy and the inter-Korean relations, I'd like to ask two ambassadors uh, to a little bit uh, uh, more focused and make some more comments on the geopolitical uh, challenges and the new, uh, uh, new uh, agenda that the two presidents uh, would be uh, discussing. Uh, Ambassador Ahn, do you have any comments? You're muted. Ambassador Ahn, uh, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Right. Well, well Yono, Yono, thank you so much for the, for the question. Uh, this week, earlier this week, I attended a seminar organized between uh, CSIS and Che Institute in Korea. And then one of the participants there was uh, Joe Nye. And Joe Nye had about 10 minutes. And I was quite impressed about the fact that he said, he said it at, at the very beginning of, of his statement. He said, I'm going to, there are a large number of issues I want to speak about. But at the same time, I'm going to speak about only one subject, which is where geopolitics. This is how, how Joe and I started. And, the, and then he went on by saying, Korea certainly is not a, not a stranger to the world of geopolitics. But at the same time, from his understanding of where things are going, he in fact would, would be thinking, it is, it is uh, well, International Politics 101 for, for, the, uh, for Korea to in fact to continue to further strengthen our alliance with the United States. Given all of the factors, I wouldn't go into them, given all of the factors, in fact, it will be, it will be uh, say, political science 101 for Korea to, uh, to wish to con continue to further strengthen the relations between, alliance between Korea and the United States. 
And then whenever I meet with the, with the John I, I am reminded about the book he wrote back in 1990, or, or soon after the end of the Cold War, the book was titled Bound to Lead. And as you could guess from the title of the book, what he in fact advocated very forcibly in the book was, the United States in fact must continue to play the leadership role even, even in the post-Cold War world. That in fact was what he was suggesting. And uh, what I think is this, which is, there was 1990s, after 30 years. And then when I first read it as a young man, I said to myself, it in fact was a very relevant message very timely message in the early years of, of the post-Cold War world. But what, what I think about the book these days, and then this in fact is something I tell Joe and I from time to time, which is the, what I think about the book is, well, the message is even relevant today. That's what I truly think about it. And, uh, and uh, where, where geopolitics, geopolitics, that in fact is uh, what I would say uh, the kind of role that, uh, that uh, well, all those countries should be playing for all different kinds of factors underlying their, their, their nation as, 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 a, as, a, as a sovereign state. And then of course, as a sovereign state, they should be thinking about say, say security, prosperity, prestige, but at the same time, values underlying their societies uh, which in fact would be enabling them to be pursuing those those uh, those uh, those uh, say say proper those objectives. So well, it is in fact uh, well considering all of those factors together that I I talked about why strategic ambiguity wouldn't wouldn't work in my mind. It should be strategic clarity. Thank you. Um... Ambassador Stevens, do you have uh, any comments before we move on to the next panel? Well, I, I, I make this comment. I, I, um, uh, I, I hope that the U.S. Uh, continues to lead, and I, I think it is important. I, I agree that uh, you know the U.S. is, is uh, the world is a better place when the U.S. is is able to 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 uh, take a leadership role, as I uh, generally speaking. Um, but I think we've got to get a lot better at it. Um, I think we face uh, a lot of new challenges now, uh, and that's that's the geopolitical challenge. So my comment is, um, I, th I think we, we need to up our diplomacy. We need to get smarter. And one thing we need to get smarter about is, is, is about other countries. And I'm going to recommend a book since, since is, we're talking about universities. And it's one, it's only about 200 pages long, and it's by a Yale historian named uh, Odd Arn Wested. And he's, it's called Empire and Righteous Nation. 600 years of, of China-Korea uh, relations, but there's a lot of Japan in there too. And uh, I've been saying to everyone getting ready for the summit or whatever it is, is uh, we don't write planes anymore, but pick up the book, turn off your computer and read 200 pages because um, it's, uh, uh, you know, we Americans, we've learned in our own, our own trials and tribulations over the past year that uh, history is with us. And uh, when I read that, you know, you know, I, I, I get some understanding of what geopolitics looks like from the point of view of Korea uh, and indeed of China and Japan. And we need to understand that better if we're going to lead. Thank you, Ambassador Stevens. I wish we have more time for the first panel, but we have two more uh, panels uh, waiting for us and uh, we do have a round table uh, session. So uh, uh, let us uh, uh, re uh, serve uh, some uh, more important topics uh, on the per first panel uh, for the round, round table discussion. And with that, let me move on to, uh, to the uh, second topic, which is US-North Korea relations. I'm delighted to introduce two uh, renowned North Korea experts. Uh, first, uh, Frank Januzzi, uh, president and CEO of the Mansfield Foundation. He previously served as deputy executive director at Amnesty International USA and uh, policy director of uh, East Asian and Pacific Affairs for the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, where he advised then committee chairman Joe Biden. Our next speaker is uh, Jung Chol Lee, a professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Seoul National University. Uh, prior to joining uh, SNU, he was a, a professor at Sungshil University 
and the Chief of Economic Security Research Team at the Samsung Economic Research Institute. He was also a visiting scholar at GW uh, Seeger Center for Asian Studies in 2014. So welcome back, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Frank. Thank you, Yun Ho. And if uh, anyone introduces themselves as a North Korea expert, uh, you should check your back uh, pocket for your wallet and make sure it's safe. Um, so I won't claim to be a North Korea expert. Uh, I'm delighted to join this event this morning, and I was uh, privileged to be welcomed uh, by the Institute of Far Eastern Studies at Kyungnam University last fall, uh, even during COVID. So I'm grateful to the scholars there as well and to GW. And it's wonderful to see Celeste, a uh, thriving uh, uh, member, proud, uh, we're proud of her at Mansfield Foundation as a member of our network for the future. Um, and, and her uh, uh, continued success is a source of great uh, satisfaction uh, to us. Uh, but it's all because of her hard work, not, not Mansfield. <laughs> Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the Biden North Korea policy, and um, uh, I think that what's interesting to me about it is that it seems to strike a balance between uh, the Obama administration approach, which was criticized for being too passive, and uh, uh, other people gave it the name strategic patience. That was never the name that they used themselves, but uh, that came to characterize the Obama approach. Uh, and it was a, an approach that was marked by a certain amount of passivity in terms of waiting for the North Koreans to engage America rather than um, uh, taking the initiative and, and putting the North Koreans on the back foot uh, by engaging them. Um, and at the other extreme, you had uh, Donald Trump's first uh, year in office, maximum pressure, fire and fury, uh, an approach that seemed uh, rooted in intimidation and uh, an attempt to uh, catalyze uh, a crisis on the peninsula out of which might emerge some diplomatic opportunity. And indeed, we did see uh, a pendulum swing from the Trump administration from maximum pressure, fire and fury uh, to maximum love and comfort and attention and, and uh, almost idolization. Uh, of Kim Jong-un uh, by President Trump uh, in the last couple of years that he served as president. Uh, president Biden seems intent on striking some middle ground uh, between these extremes of a passive uh, Obama approach and a mercurial and aggressive, uh, but nonetheless innovative uh, Trump approach. Um, it has been called by some the Goldilocks uh, approach uh, for those not familiar with the fairy tale of Goldilocks, a uh, uh, you know, little girl lost in the woods uh, comes to the house of, uh, of a family of bears, uh, and she enters the house, and one bowl of porridge is, is too hot, and one is too cold, and the other is just right. Um, uh, she goes upstairs after lunch, and one bed is too hard, and one is too soft, and one is just right. Uh, and she falls asleep in the bed, uh, safe and comfortable, uh, where the bear family finds her when they return home. Um, the problem with this approach, uh, the idea that uh, Biden is trying to uh, strike the Goldilocks uh, principle and, and find the porridge and the bed that is just right for North Korea, is that North Korea is not a little girl wandering in the woods. Um, and uh, so the concern I have about the Biden approach um, is that uh, the North Koreans may not cooperate with the patient, diplomatic, incremental um, uh, approach, almost a scientific diplomatic approach uh, that the Biden administration uh, seems intent on pursuing. Um, I will say there, there are admirable qualities about what the Biden administration is seeking to do here. Um, by avoiding the idea of a grand bargain, they're basically acknowledging that a dramatic breakthrough with North Korea is unlikely, and that progress will likely come in a step-by-step, action-for-action, reciprocal uh, formula uh, that will enable the parties to build trust. I also strongly applaud the alliances first concept of the Biden administration. Uh, there, there cannot be a successful U.S. approach to North Korea that is not rooted and anchored in the U.S. ROK alliance 
while also being carefully coordinated uh, with Japan and other key allies in the region, and also coordinated with China. Um, and I think that in contrast to the Trump administration, the Biden team views China not as a spoiler in this effort, uh, but as a vital partner in the effort of bringing peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, uh, a partner with whom the United States does not share uh, all of our interests, but does have sufficient common ground to work together uh, on, on uh, North Korea. And I also want to applaud uh, the Biden administration for acknowledging that human rights must be a part of the US-North Korea diplomacy. It's not that uh, you condition progress on changes in North Korea's human rights posture. You don't hold diplomacy hostage to a nation's poor human rights record. Uh, the United States did not uh, demand uh, that China end the Cultural Revolution uh, before we uh, reached out diplomatically. Uh, the United States today uh, did not demand uh, that Vietnam uh, become a multi-party democracy, fully respectful of all of the individual liberties of its citizens in order to have an embassy in Hanoi. Uh, but uh, it would be an illusion for the United States to say to North Korea, we can be normal, a uh, friendly uh, country with North Korea at a time when North Korea is imprisoning uh, 200,000 uh, or 150,000 of its citizens in political labor camps. Uh, th that would be a diplomatic malpractice. Uh, so I think it's good that the Biden administration has acknowledged uh, that those issues are going to be a part uh, of, uh, of any dialogue with North Korea. I'm going to stop because I, I, I really look forward to the discussion. I, I think that the key point in my mind uh, that's going to be a challenge of policy coordination uh, is that the Moon Jae-in administration, uh, for very understandable reasons, is eager to uh, use its last year in office in a kind of a full court press uh, to try to make progress in North-South relations and, and toward denuclearization. And I think that the Biden team is probably working on a different timeline. Uh, and, and I think that uh, there's going to be some tugging and pulling there uh, between the two presidents as they try to uh, decide how high a priority to attach to uh, diplomatic uh, initiatives on the peninsula. Uh, I expect that to be a subject of considerable discussion next week. Um, and I think there will also be discussion about uh, the role of China uh, uh, in the, the, uh, the North Korea equation, uh, because I believe that uh, Seoul appreciates that uh, uh, on the one hand, the U.S. is indispensable uh, to any uh, diplomatic solution, uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, an approach that sidelines China or treats China as an adversary in the, in the uh, Korean Peninsula equation uh, is also likely to fail. Um, and, and so uh, the United States is going to need to find a way, and I think Biden can do that, uh, but the United States is going to need to find a way to work with China even though many other aspects of the U.S.-China relationship are indeed uh, very fraught uh, with tension and, and uh, adversarial thinking right now in Washington. Let me stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I think if, uh, Frank uh, gave us a lot of uh, food for thoughts. And uh, let me turn it over to uh, Professor Chung Chul Lee. Yeah. 우리 자누치 선생님께서 지난 자누치 visited Korea last year end despite of COVID-19 and he delivered wonderful lecture about the policies of the Biden administration to Korean audiences that were very helpful and taking this opportunity I'd like to express my sincere appreciation now I'd like to share my opinions on the possibilities of North Korea and U.S. relations. Many are controversial about if North Korea would show any reaction to the overtures made by the Biden administration. Many under, as many understand that 
Biden administration's policy towards North Korea is different from the one from Obama administration. How they explain that will shape the reaction from North Korea. According to one article in Washington Post, April 30th, it said the Biden North Korea policy is not anything like everything for everything of a Trump administration, nor nothing for nothing of Obama administration. It's in the middle. So it may be around exchange between partial sanction and partial incentives. If that is translated as no, USA is having an intention to resolve some stalled uh, relations between the two countries at the Hanoi summit, then North Korea will respond. Many also talked about the comment made by Mr. Jung Kwon. Kwon and many consider the comment as a criticism. And he released a statement on 2nd May, but I think that is a question, not critic. And the question is that at the state of address messages, President Biden said North Korea is a serious threat to US and the global security. And regarding that, Mr. Guan said that we are very accustomed to for the USA to call North Korea as a threat to their security and global security. We don't care about that. But the first two speech of the leader of the United States consider North Korea as a threat. That means they will maintain their hostility towards North Korea? That's the question, actually. It takes the form of a critic, but the essence is a question to no USA. The next day, the advisor Sullivan had a press conference with the ABC and answered that question. The answer says that, that does not start from hostility. That is only about to find solution. That's not aimed at hostility, but it aimed at the solution. I think it is indirect dialogue between North Korea and the US. And the next day again, and USA said that they gonna explain their policy towards North Korea and North Korea answered after a year, we receive it well. So that was the first contact after a year from North Korea. So we can guess North Korea has a, has some expectations for USA. I think now is important. During the last election campaign, President Biden called Kim Jong-un as a thug or gang. And since then, the US government didn't show any respect to North Korea. All authoritarian regime considers the name, how to call their leader is really important. In a state union message, President of the United States called Kim Jong-il as outpost of tyranny. Because of that, North Korea denied to have negotiation. That lasted about four, five months back then. Then President Bush called Mr. Kim Jong-il as Mr. Kim Jong-il. Next day, North Korean official answered that, we respect you to call us Mr. So we will resume our dialogue. That's 
the background how we achieve September 9th joint declaration. And during uh, when we had the summit meeting between South Korea and USA, just like the examples President Bush made, I sincerely wish President Biden to call Kim Jong-un as his official name, to call him President Kim Jong-un is making all atmosphere fresh. It. So it's gonna give them uh, some, uh, the reason and some verification for them to re go uh, returning back to the negotiation table. And the second thing is that uh, the Biden administration says they oppose and builds on the Singapore agreement. Then one of the key issue of the Singapore agreement is the declaration of the end of the war. And that is still relevant that we have to show that that is relevant to North Korea. So the process of declaring the end of the war is still alive and there is a possibility for us to make it. So if we make it clear to North Korea, then they will make some gesture and they are more likely to return to the negotiation table. Last but not least, North Korea still strongly against joint military exercise between ROK and US. So the next summit between North Korea, USA or Korea will happen when we had the Beijing Olympic games. The engine, we have the dialogue chances before having the Olympic games that will largely depend on uh, our you know, gestures toward, and the sincerity towards North Korea. So what policies we're gonna show will persuade them to come back to the negotiation table. I think the both leader, two leaders of USA and ROK should consider these three things in their mind when they had a summit meeting. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Lee. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left for the second panel, but I I'd like to ask uh, both Frank uh, and Professor Lee uh, to make a, a, a brief comments on each other's uh, presentation. And uh, uh, Frank, uh, can you a uh, little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, focus on uh, how the Biden administration uh, would respond uh, to uh, the concerns North Korea uh, uh, may have as uh, Professor Lee uh, presented? Thanks so much. Yes, I'll try to be concise. So. Um, I think one of the things that President Biden understands very well about the Korean Peninsula is that if the United States expects North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons program, consistent with UN Security Council resolutions and the will of the international community, the United States and South Korea must find ways to ensure that the North Korean state feels secure. Uh, North Korea is entitled to have security. Um, and as part of any denuclearization uh, arrangement, uh, North Korea's legitimate security interests have to be taken into account. And I think that this is something that uh, the Biden administration can convey to the North Koreans, um, uh, which will in increase their interest in dialogue. The sources of conflict between nations were identified by the Greek historian Thucydides as three, issues of honor, interests, uh, 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 issues of fear, and, and, and issues of national interest, honor, fear, and interest. And I think that we should remember this ancient lesson from Greece when we think about North Korea, because as Professor Lee has said, issues of honor and, and uh, uh, respect are very much on the minds of the North Korean government. And so are issues of fear. Uh, North Korea is a small, relatively isolated country, relatively weak compared to all of its neighbors in every uh, measurement, um, and surrounded by much larger uh, uh, powers, many of them nuclear armed. So it is understandable that their, their government uh, has 
national security high on their list of priorities. But then there are interests. And among those interests are the betterment of the welfare of the North Korean people. Uh, and I think there's an opening here as well. Uh, there's an opening for the United States both to convey to the North Korean uh, leadership a certain amount of respect uh, and, uh, for their, uh, their, their uh, state, uh, but also there's a, an opportunity to work together on things like COVID uh, because the North Korean state uh, uh, is in a weak public health situation uh, and has requirements uh, for the public health of their own citizens that, that could be addressed uh, cooperatively by the international community. Um, so I hope that there will be opportunities there for the United States to find a way to, to build a, a, a dialogue with North Korea. Uh, and and I, I hope it's one uh, that can be done uh, comprehensively uh, across many layers, uh, not just focused only on denuclearization, uh, but really looking at the totality of the human uh, condition uh, on the peninsula. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Professor Lee, do, did you want to make uh, any quick comment? Well, regarding the comment made by Mr. Janucci, I totally agree with him. But when it comes to human rights, I want to talk about methodology. I want to make a very short point. When it comes to North Korean human rights issue, that's really serious and dire. Without human rights issue, we can't make any policy or improvement with North Korea. We have to, the key is whether we're gonna improve the tangible and practical human rights in North Korea. It should not be the nominal human rights improvement in North Korea, but we have to improve the human rights of North Korean residents in real and actual practical level. Professor Victor Cha once mentioned basket. When we are having the negotiation with North Korea, uh, we have to have a basket as we used in Helsinki declaration, and the basket should include everything like a conventional weapon and nukes and human rights and economic sanction lift or anything else. And what should be in the basket and how many baskets we should have and which topics should go what basket. After we have the basket, we can have a negotiation with North Korea. When we try to resolve human rights issue, we have to have a very a realistic approaches before having and before suggesting or raising the human rights issue. We have to have this kind of, you know, a tools. And as Chanuchi mentioned, the human security is also very important and COVID-19 and some public health issue is also important. We have to see that from the human rights perspective. So that should be included in that basket. And how we gonna form that basket is another topic to negotiate. That's it, thank you. No, can I just add one brief thought? Okay, <laughs> really brief. I strongly agree with Professor Lee. And I think that the key is that sometimes when a problem is hard to solve, the solution is to make the problem definition bigger, not smaller. And on the Korean Peninsula, we need to uh, find a way to address the many, many issues we have. Uh, that doesn't mean a grand bargain. It just means that when you are working comprehensively, uh, you have more opportunities to find progress. Um, and, and these problems are interconnected. Thank you, Frank. Um, I think we're gonna have a, a you know, con a, we, we can continue the interesting discussion uh, at the round table discussion. And uh, let me move on to the next uh, panel, uh, which is uh, inter-Korean relations. And I'm also delighted to introduce two prominent experts today. Uh, Yeon Chol Kim is the chairman of the board of the Korea Peace Forum and a professor of the Department of Korea Unification at Inje University in South Korea. He previously served as South Korea's Minister of Unification, 
president of the Korea Institute for National Unification and a policy advisor to the Minister of uh, Unification. And last but not least, uh, Celeste Arrington is Korea Foundation Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at uh, GW. Uh, she specializes in comparative politics with a regional focus on the Koreas and Japan. And she's the author of Accidental Activists, Victims and Government Accountability in South Korea and Japan. With that, uh, let me turn it over to Minister Kim. Great to see you all. First of all, thank you for organizing this great event. My special thanks goes to the co both of the co-hosts and the former Ambassador Stevenson and Mr. Janucci. Very happy to see you. And Professor Ellington, nice to see you. I think it's the first time to see you. Uh, so I'd like to exchange my opinions about uh, the inter-Korean relations. After we have the Hanoi summit, the inter-Korean relations has faced a lot of challenges while we face another stalemate between ROK and US relations. So in the upcoming summit meeting between ROK and US, will be that will be a great chance to improve these old relations that throughout this, uh, the summit meeting, not only the ROK and US relations, but also inter-Korean relations can improve. To make that happen, we have to understand uh, the strategies and environment of North Korea I think three are important. First is after we failed at the Hanoi, they are very careful. So in the process to resume the negotiation table, we have to rebuild the trust and how to rebuild the trust will be a big task and challenge. We check it when we had the Hanoi summit and given the nature of North Korean political uh, characteristics, the authorities and right of the officials is very limited, while the role and influence of the political leader is huge. So Biden understands the importance of the summit between China and North Korea. So summit has a clear role to play, but the, the, the lower level talks is also important. So the lower level officials should have more authority and leeways to uh, to proceed with the successful conclusion. But we, they, Biden administration should understand the leeway and the influences of a North Korean lower level official is all the more limited. And the second is that uh, the North Korea is very close with China. To overcome the COVID-19, they became closer. And also when they reopened the international trade, Sino-North Korea relations is key to North Korea. And the third, North Korea believes the nuke is working for their domestic economy as well because the economic situation is very dire there. So they use nuclear development and nuclear weapons as one, uh, one thing they can take pride of. So they never let it go. So we have to understand the economic situation and international relations and opening up the gates to the world how we can make a balance between all three is the key. So I think these three points is important. So to sum it up, how to rebuild the trust, that is the first thing, because the trust, not only from uh, North Korea and USA, but inter-Korean relations, to rebuild the confidence and trust is the key. 
and when we resolve the North Korean nuclear issue, we always talk about the gradual approach, but the speed is the key when we are making gradual approach. So how we can speed up the pace largely depend on trust that we are having each other. And the role of China is essential as well. All in all, how we can, you go, how we can um, make a balance between the US-China competition and US-North Korea relation. And third is North Korean nuke. Globally, to keep the MPT at the global level, North Korean nuke is a symbolic position and everything is intertwined and interconnected. And also that plays a key role in North East Asia dynamics. So we have to put North Korean nuke on top priority. So in the future, when we try to resolve these issue, as I mentioned, I believe three are the key. The first is that to resume uh, the negotiation of North Korean nuke is key. We have to resume it as soon as possible. If we push it too much, or if we hurry up to open it too early, then we may be in unfavorable position and we may have more challenging issues. So we have to be a little bold when it comes to resume the North Korean nuke negotiation. And the second is that uh, USA should understand correctly about inter-Korean relations because currently North Korea is very close to China. The role of China is getting bigger to resolve North Korean issue. So if we really serious to resolve North Korean nukes and many others, not only the China, but also our case role is very important. But given all the current situations, including sanctions and the priority of denuclearization, the gap between North and South should be limited and minimized. And the pace to improve North and US relations should be same as the one between inter-Koreans. But what I believe important is that it's not about speed, but about rule of each parties. The goal is to have every party to play their own role. So South Korea's role is more important. Last but not least, in inter-Korean relations, human exchanges and humanitarian aid to revitalize the humanitarian aid and human exchanges, we have to help North Korea to overcome COVID-19 early on. So we can provide the humanitarian aid for them to overcome uh, COVID-19. And when it comes to the humanitarian aid, we have to have a very flexible approach for sanction. That's it. Thank you, Minister Kim. Now, Celeste, you have the last word. <laughs> This is an unenviable task, um, and it's an honor to join many illustrious panelists and also to see good friends. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, I guess I'd like to shift the focus a bit to South Korean uh, domestic politics and to examine inter-Korean affairs from that perspective. So the Moon Jae-in administration with a year left in office faces uh, two major challenges. One is that time is running out. Um, and he may very much want to cement a legacy in terms of producing some kind of gains for an irreversible peace on the peninsula, but time is running out. And the second is that we have relatively few indications of North Korean willingness. Um, and Frank mentioned that the Biden administration's timeline may be different from Moon Jae-in's. Um, Kim Jong-un or Pyongyang's timeline may be different 
from Moon Jae-in's as well. Um, and so I think we may uh, face the challenges of time here. It could be that North Korea is um, you know, refraining from engaging in all of the provocations that it might want to do at the current state, but we also don't have many indications uh, of a great willingness to step forward on inter-Korean affairs. So from Moon Jae-in, President Moon Jae-in's um, perspective, what's the political calculus here? And I think uh, from the, sort of a longer term perspective, there are a couple of major changes in South Korean um, domestic politics that I'd like to highlight that change the pros and the cons of foregrounding North Korea in the, the last year of his administration. It, he, um, in emphasizing North Korea, may be uh, playing into the hands of conservatives in South Korea. And the anti-leafleting law from last December is a prime example. Um, the conservatives have become more organized in civil society. Uh, the infrastructure for emphasizing North Korean human rights issues is much more developed than it was under Moon Jae-in's prior bosses, No Mu Hyun and Kim Dae Jun. And so they have an opportunity with the anti-leafleting law to um, become much more vocal and to activate communities in the US, including in Congress, um, that want to criticize the Moon administration's approach uh, to inter-Korean affairs. At the same time, uh, South Korean voters, according to surveys, um, have dramatically shifted in their perspective perspective on North Korea. So especially among the people in their 20s, 10 years ago, they were the um, least likely or the lowest sense that North Korea is a threat to South Korea. But um, today, the Institute for Peace and Unification Studies at Seoul National University, their survey finds that the highest level of threat perception is among people in their 20s. So voters are shifting, and this should uh, sort of change the political calculus for the Moon administration in terms of prioritizing progress on inter-Korean affairs in his last um, year in office. Similarly, the, um, the infrastructure for mobilizing against Moon Jae-in um, politically is more developed in South Korean civil society. Um, and so then the, the question is in his last year in office, um, is North Korea going to become a priority? Or according to polls, the bigger priorities for South Korean voters are real estate prices, unfair real estate tax systems, jobs, dealing with COVID, including ramping up the pace of vaccinations. Um, and so I think for the political calculus for this administration, um, the challenges are great. Uh, as much as Moon, President Moon may want to achieve progress towards an irreversible peace um, is pushing that too hard going to essentially hand next year's presidential election to conservatives um, and embolden conservative voices in society um, in South Korean society uh, and so I think this is an um, a very challenging and difficult question for President Moon um, and the Biden administration, as they approach the summit next week, should um, certainly consider the uh, the challenges domestically, politically for President Moon as he approaches the inter-Korean relationship. Uh, thank you, Celeste. Um, Minister Kim, do, do you have uh, any uh, comments on Celeste's uh, presentation? Uh, I think especially uh, Celeste uh, pointed out the domestic uh, political timeline and domestic uh, uh, opinion that, that's uh, kind of shifting away, uh, not in quite in favor of the, the current uh, Moon administration. So do you have any uh, response to that? Yeah, uh, the case, I want to make a couple of comments. I am teaching college students at the university, so I have a lot of chances to have an interrelations with youngsters in their 20s. But unlike what you said, uh, the 
opinions and attitude in those in monies are not much different from the average Koreans. First, what we have to consider is that younger generations are are very um, pessimistic and uh, the critic criticizing the North Korea. But how to manage inter-Korean relations is different from their critical position about North Korea. Having said that, young generations of Korean do not want to have higher tensions on the Korean Peninsula. It goes everyone, that goes, you know, not only young generations, but all Koreans do not want to see the escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula, whether it is military, it prone to war or some others. Of course, uh, we had uh, re elections recently and his tenure is only one year left. But when it comes to North Korea and the inter-Korean relations, two perspectives is important. First is that it should not be linked to domestic politics. Recently, one thing we found common in election is that conservative Koreans try to use inter-Korean relations for their uh, goals in the political agenda, but that didn't work well. So just like Nomuyan administration, at the last moment of his tenure, he succeeded to have a summit meeting between two Koreas. What's more important is that the peace on the Korean Peninsula is a long-term task. We shouldn't resolve it overnight. Everyone agree with it. So it's not like, just like you are running on the relay run and you just to do your part and the remaining work should be carried out by the next player or next administration. That's my comment. Thank you, Celeste. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a really interesting use of time in all of our different presentations. Um, and. It's a good reminder, um, Professor Kim, from the end of the Nomo Hyun administration, he achieved a summit meeting, um, which was later criticized by conservatives. Uh, but compared to his father, Kim Jong il, Kim Jong un um, has wider swings in policy. So it is perfectly uh, plausible that within the next year, we will see a uh, dramatic shift back towards engagement uh, with South Korea from North Korea. And I, I think maybe even more likely than during the end of the Nomu Hyun administration. Um, I think the sense that voters are voting on the basis of domestic, political, and economic, and real estate price issues is, um, is clear from the surveys. But yes, you're right that at the background of those is if tensions increase on the Korean Peninsula, um, that could negatively impact the uh, economy and certainly across the board, um, voters don't want to see a return to say 2017 or the, the tensions of 2010. Um, but I, I think this, this question of time and ultimately it's, it's a little bit of a waiting game to see how North Korea responds um, both to the Biden administration and um, to North Korea. And that's uh, not ideal in terms of policy planning. Um, but I think most importantly, as we head into the summit next week, is to bolster U.S. ROK coordination uh, to be ready when North Korea responds. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, with that, let me move on to uh, uh, the next uh, next uh, 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 session, which is a roundtable discussion. Um, since uh, this webinar is uh, focused on the Biden's North Korea policy, uh, I'd like to ask uh, the speakers to uh, a little bit more uh, think about, uh, you know, how, uh, what kind of uh, uh, new approach we can uh, expect from uh, the Biden administrations. And uh, 
I think we have a couple of uh, uh, topics that uh, were hotly, if you will, debated uh, by the speakers, uh, which are when and how to resume uh, nuclear negotiations uh, with North Korea and what would be uh, the uh, proactive rather than passive uh, elements of Biden's North Korea policy. And uh, what are the uh, roles uh, that uh, China can play in this picture? And uh, how we can deal with uh, North Korea's human rights issue. So uh, we already had a very uh, informative discussion between uh, Frank and uh, Chang Chol, but uh, I, I'd like to invite uh, other uh, speakers to uh, give their thoughts on this issue. So. Now, whoever wants to go first, just let me know. Frank, do you, uh, do you have two fingers? <laughs> uh, no, I was I was no. waiting for Ambassador Stevens to to share some wisdom. To be honest, uh, I, I, my thought to your question briefly is is only that um, you know I'm I'm looking also at the Q and A box, uh, and several people have asked about you know, how Biden could try to get things moving. And I, I think that Celeste and, and uh, uh, Yun Chul Kim both uh, uh, reintroduced the concept of time, you know, into this diplomatic equation. You know, how does the Biden and, and Moon administrations uh, move forward with the time that they have to try to engage North Korea? And, and I, I, uh, it goes also to the question of trust, uh, which has been raised by several of the speakers. And my only observation there is based on, on uh, many years of, of uh, uh, discussions with DPRK officials. And, and my experience is that trust is built slowly over time by uh, making commitments and fulfilling those commitments. Uh, trust can be eroded very quickly, uh, but, but trust is built slowly. Uh, and it's built through the accumulation uh, of, of people speaking the truth, uh, making commitments and fulfilling those commitments. Um, and so while it's true uh, that the Biden administration may not have much to offer North Korea in terms of sanctions relief, uh, because they don't expect North Korea to offer much in terms of denuclearization, um, I don't know that that's especially relevant to the question of trust building. Trust building can be built on small steps so incremental progress on uh, freezing activities at Yongbyon can be rewarded with incremental small uh, uh, sanctions relief. And as long as the promises are made by both sides and kept by both sides, then that will help to build trust. And the same is true on human rights issues. No one expects North Korea to dismantle their social system uh, 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 any more than the United States is going to magically solve the human rights problems that we face here. Uh, but uh, small steps that are promised and fulfilled, issues of transparency, issues of dialogue, a willingness to engage uh, on human rights issues, you know, can, can result in trust building. So my recommendation there is, is simply that, that um, uh, uh, let's not try to rush to a completion but let's do rush to make some small commitments, fulfill those commitments, uh, and begin the trust building process as soon as possible. Thank you. Ambassador Stevens. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I actually, I mean, I, I agree with the, uh, the importance of, of, of building trust. I actually prefer, and I know uh, the word confidence, even though I know CBMs or confidence building measures are associated with, you know, other negotiations and other contexts. But I, I think we have to be realistic that trust is, as I understand, trust is a hard commodity to build between uh, North Korea and anybody else. There's going to be a lot of lack of trust. And actually, re referred, if I can go on a tangent on that, I'd be interested in what people, especially our Korean friends, think about what the impact of, of having the summit meetings of Kim Jong-un meeting with an American president, not once, but twice, or I guess you could say three times, um, is on things going forward. Because, you know, in the history of this thing, a lot of people used to say 
you know, you've got to go to the top. The U.S. has got to take a bold step and have these, uh, you know, and, and meet at the top. Well, that happened. And, you know, clearly it didn't happen the way that worked. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. But, you know, if you're Kim Jong-un, do you really want to meet with another American president? Uh, absent a lot of trust and confidence building going forward? Um, you know, I, I, I think the answer, so, so that's another way of getting back to saying, Whatever the U.S. does, I mean, even if even if President Biden say, "Hey, you know, I'll meet you anywhere, anytime," how would you feel about if it, if you're Kim Jong Un? I think you'd hesitate. So I think we have to be one mindful. It's not all about what the U.S. does. That two, it is about small steps that prepare the con prepare the, the the groundwork for it. Um, and, and, you know, maybe we can think of some slightly different processes. For example, I, and I'm not sure it's a good idea or not, but for example, you know, the traditional diplomatic thing is to kind of try out ideas quietly through different channels, try to find those channels. You know, what if, what if Washington and Seoul came out with kind of a menu, said, here's what we'd be prepared to start with? You know, uh, uh, and again, I, the, the menu, I don't think this is the time and place to go and what would that would be, but you know, no testing, uh, no, you know, uh, something, at, inspectors at Young Beyond, whatever, whatever, and, and just put it out there. Or what if it was in another multilateral context? I think those are things that are worth exploring. Uh, but, I, but stepping back a, a minute, I do think that we, we there is a recognition on the part of the Biden administration, which I certainly don't speak for, and in the United States, that we are at a very different place than we were 10 or 15 years ago. And whatever one thought was possible 10 or 15 years ago, or indeed, even those of us who were before the first nuclear test, is not possible now. And what do I mean by that? I'm, I'm going to use an analogy that may... Uh, I hope it doesn't upset anybody, but I, if you think in terms of a religion like Christianity, there's kind of the evangelical approach that says right up front, you've got to demonstrate that your heart is in this, that you sincerely believe this is it. And so, you know, complete and total in this, in this case, you know, denuclearization. I'm convinced, I understand that I've been wrong. I'm going to find the path to the light, but I accept that now. And then there's another kind of path in Christianity, if I say, which is kind of works-based, which is I have my doubts. I don't know where this is going to lead, but I think there's some value here in going along this road. And um, I, I think we're, we need to be on that second path, not that first path. Thank you. Celeste? Sure, I agree very much with what Frank and Kathy just said. Um, and I think the challenge here is to build trust or confidence, you need a lot of channels of communication. And I think the challenge of the last year is that many of those have been severed or dormant or um, whatever. And so potentially the Moon Jae-in speech that earlier this week about for his fourth anniversary of his administration, signaling that um, South Korea wants to abide by inter-Korean agreements going back to the 1972 agreement by not criticizing each other. Uh, through the leafleting and so upholding the anti-leafleting law is one signal but these are public signals and it would be helpful to have many different channels of communication um, potentially diverse forums like the the global vaccine initiative Gavi and things like that through which to engage North Korea on a range of different issues and incrementally build back up lines of communication through which trust can be built. Thank you. I think our Korean speakers uh, uh, would like to speak about the South Korea's or uh, North Korea's view uh, yeah. on the specific issue. 그 신뢰 구축 관련해서 When it comes to building trust I think we should set high standard and high expectation. One professor named Kuk Chan said in his book, there are two different types of tool store. The first stage of trust is projectability. And the second stage is a bondage. Now we are standing at the stage two, when we, when we talk about trust with North Korea, we consider the second stage. But 
North Korea is at hostility. So if we just remove hostility from the table, then that is a very positive and big stride towards to rebuild trust. So we can check trajectability of North Korea and also make our, ourselves transparent. That is very infant level and we are working on it. So we have built this level of trust. But if we expect too much about trust, what I mean is that if we want to have a bondage level of trust with North Korea, I think that is not realistic. I want all of us should bear that. And second point I want to make is that Professor Celester talked about some survey research of Seoul National University. And there is a, a unification peace research center in the SNU. They did that survey and that conducted the last June and July. Around that time, North Korea exploded uh, the liaison office in Kaesong industrial complex. So back then, many feel afraid of the threat coming from North Korea. And coincidentally, around at the time, the survey was conducted. I think your uh, point and is relevant, but you have to understand the very special environment uh, of, of, of the survey. That's it. Thank you. Any more comments uh, from our Korean speakers? Uh, I want to make one comment. When it comes to the leafletting, I want to deliver uh, correct information. For the leafletting, from conservative Cons conservatively, they believe that is too much, but at the government level, sending the leaflet to North Korea is not allowed, even during the conservative administration didn't allow them to send the leafletting. There is a clear reason. Instead of sending the propaganda leaflet to North Korea, most of them fall down in the villages in the DMZ and the border area. And the physical and emotional damage because of that leaflet was huge. So we have to bear that in mind. So we are not uh, making a new law to stop uh, sending the leaflet, leaflet now. And even the during even during the conservative administrations, they uh, prevent sending leaflet to North Korea because it is to protect the South Korean people's health and uh, mind. And also, it, according to international conventions and regulations, sending balloons to North Korea is not allowed according to any other international laws. You can find many cases, in some cases happened in 1950s, that is very general and universal and common international norms and standards. What's more important is that we, of course, we need to improve the human rights of North Korea. As many experts mentioned, we have to find an actual solution to improve the human rights in real actual, actual level. But the reflecting is about peaceful means for the peaceful goals. So human rights, should be dealt with some sense of human rights. 
What I mean is that we have to persuade North Korea to improve their human rights, not from our perspective, but from their uh, level. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to a different topic, uh, uh, Ambassador An, uh, did you have any comment? Well, one of the things we have been talking about, uh, say, new North Korean policy of President Biden was, where, where, of course, we are still trying to learn about the specifics of, of the plan, but one of the things which we understand would be part of the plan would be incremental approach. And then in my mind, there will be two different kinds of incremental approach, which would be incremental approach, which would be implementation of, uh, of a longer term, longer term plan, which in fact would be implemented step by step. That would be incremental approach. But another kind of incremental approach would be, well, without any idea about in which direction those, uh, those small deals are moving into, just agreeing upon deal after deal after deal. So there would be two different kinds of incre incremental approach. Ideally, I think, I think far better incremental approach would be the first kind in the, in the sense that, well, I would put it a kind of salami tactic versus roadmap approach. Salami tactic meaning, well, any approach would be good. And then uh, that, that in fact would be what I call salami tactic, but at the same time, uh, well, salami tactic, the problem with the salami tactic would be, well, in the process of, uh, well, making those deals, deal by deal by deal, then of course you would be in a sense wasting all of your leverages. And then by the end of the process, then you in fact would be end up the ending up in a situation where your leverages are gone, but there is no say, say orientation leading to your final goal. Final goal. So incremental approach is all right, but at the same time, my preference would be it will be done as a part of uh, overall, overall, overall roadmap. And, and then having said that, uh, well, what, uh, one, one impression I had is this, which is uh, there seems to be certain, uh, say, well, when we were discussing about the trust, I was very glad about the, the comment being made by Professor Chung Chul Lee in the sense that, well, trust between, for example, Korea and then the United States, well, when we talk about the trust between, well, in, in the Indo-Korean relationship, well, of course, we cannot, in fact, have a well, bloated expectation of a trust in Indo-Korean relationship. I really, really appreciate the point. And uh, well, definitely, I will just try to look up that, that Kupchan definition of <laughs> definition of trust. But what I'm feeling is this, which is, uh, well, listening to all these uh, North Korean policy related discussions these today, to these discussions today, I may be wrong, but there seems to be certain uh, say uh, self remorse about the fact that nothing worked in the past. And then and that, that, in fact, was the, was the impression I had when I was reading that uh, Jen Psaki statement, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki statement made, made on April 30th. And then she said it didn't work. Under, uh, she, she said it didn't work under the, first, uh, under the past four presidents. So it will be something between grand design and, uh, and uh, well, well, strategic patience. And uh, well, Frank said, said it, already said it, in the sense that, well, in Obama administration, they didn't call it the strategic patience. And then, and then somehow, that's, that's what I read in Jen Saki, Saki's statement. So my impression was, well, somehow, the underlying emotion of Jen Saki making, making that statement seems to be high degree of frustration. And from that high degree of frustration, urge to to, to, to in fact start something new. And uh, well, th th first of all, that was my observation. And then, and then what I said myself was, well, if we want to come up with a good prescription, then of course you start with a good diagnosis. What should be the diagnosis? Why did all of them fail? Not so much because those approaches were wrong, 
but because of this determination of North Korea to, to continue to develop uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. But at the same time, that is, that is my impression these days in the sense that there seems to be, that, which is understandable, high degree of frustration and an urge to try something new. But uh, I hope that, well, I, I don't have anything against trying something new, but, but at the same time, I hope it will be based upon, uh, well, solid diagnosis of what worked and what didn't work. Thank you, Ambassador An. Uh, we have around five minutes left for the, the uh, roundtable discussion, and I'd like to ask uh, uh, our speakers to, uh, uh, you know, discuss a little bit more about China's role uh, in this picture. Uh, I mean, in these days, um, every person uh, in Washington is old. You know, when you're talking about uh, security issues. Uh, China is kind of the, the most important keyword now. So um, what kind of role, uh, uh, specific role uh, do you expect China to play down the road? Yes, Frank. Well, my hope is that China will um, find common ground with the United States in the pursuit of uh, incremental progress. And I, I want to echo Ambassador Ahn's very important observation uh, that it, it is vital, I think, that we know where we're headed uh, and that we not just seek uh, minor incremental progress on issues in a sort of a random way. Uh, you know, I think we have to cross the river um, uh, and the Chinese have the expression of crossing the river by feeling the stones with your toes. Um, I think we need we need to know that we are crossing the river. I think that we don't know exactly that where the ford is. You know, we don't know exactly where the, the pathway across the river is. So we need to search around a little bit, uh, but we need to know that the goal is on the other side of the river. And the Chinese need to join us in that journey. They need to be committed uh, at the beginning uh, to a, a, uh, a goal on the Korean Peninsula that is mutually acceptable for the US, ROK, DPRK, and China. Um, if we try to identify a long-term goal um, that does not have sufficient overlap of the great power interests of the U.S. and China and sufficient overlap of the uh, Korean people, North and South, uh, then our incremental progress will, will end in the middle of the river and we will be swept downstream by the first uh, flood. Uh, so. Um, China's role here is to be a mature enough country on the global stage that they can set aside uh, the differences that they have with the United States over Taiwan policy or South China Sea policy or Hong Kong and find common ground on the peninsula. I hope that China will be that kind of a mature player uh, on the global stage. Uh, it's a 5,000 year old country, but to be honest, uh, China behaves often as an adolescent uh, on the global stage. They are relatively new to the global stage, uh, and they need to, to behave, in this case, as, as the kind of power that I know they're capable of, uh, which is to, to compartmentalize, uh, find common ground with the United States where we can, even as we are in competition, uh, or even sometimes working uh, against each other uh, on other areas. Uh, so that's, that's not easy, uh, and, and uh, it's going to be especially hard in Washington because there is a sour mood about China. So we need to, Americans need to keep more of an open mind about working with China where we do have common interests, and I think we have common interests on the peninsula. I just had, I, mean, I agree with that. No, I, actually, also I have to say, well, Frank, I learned I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I, I learned the expression uh, crossing, crossing the river by feeling the stones uh, in Korea, <laughs> crossing a lot of cold Korean rivers. But, um, uh, but I think one of the challenges, in addition to those you mentioned, is, is over the last, one of the, the results of the last four years has been that the DPRK uh, PRC relationship has gotten much, much closer. And uh, my sense is, uh, my colleagues can correct me if, if, you, if, if I'm wrong, but my sense is that 
China is not unhappy with where things are now, uh, as long as they feel that they can exert enough uh, influence on Pyongyang to stop it from going you know, too far. Uh, and of course, there is the whole question of, you know, how bad is the economic situation? How bad are the health situation? Things we haven't really addressed, but is also the backdrop of uncertainty. Um, but, but essentially, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I, I think in both Beijing and Washington, because of this state of much heightened uh, tension, as I said, more than competition, but very heightened competition that we're in right now, uh, I, I don't see a, a, a lot of signals that either side's prepared to look for areas of cooperation. Uh, but that must be sought, I agree. And climate change is often mentioned as one, and yet not much evidence is, is happening. North Korea would seem like one. Maybe that gets into I mean, some of the other questions I've seen uh, uh, popping up about, again, how do we define the, the, the issue? And if we begin to define it more in terms of, of international norms that, that include UN Security Council resolutions to which China has signed up, maybe we can find some narrow ground we can broaden to, uh, to, to bring them in, but it must be done. And there's a responsibility in both capitals to do that. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes left for this roundtable uh, discussion, but I'd like to ask our Korean speakers uh, again about, uh, I, I think, South Korea's expectation. Yeah. 일단 그 중국의 역할에 대해서 아 저도 Let me just say on the role of China. 대한 중국의 입장은 North China's stance has two levels for North Korea's nuke. We have to separate these two. First is that after the failed Hanoi summit the competition between China and USA becomes fierce and North Korea is in the middle of the two. So they, China want to include North Korea as their one of, you know, kind of tools. So they use it for many purpose, but there is another factors which works very critically. That is North Korea, nuclearized North Korea will change dynamics in Northeast Asia, but that is not what China wants. That's what happened at the six party talk and that is relevant now and that will be relevant in the future as well. China, well, to some degree, uh, China do not wanna see nuclearized North Korea because that will have that will lead to many different um, side effects. So that's the common ground among those the South Korea, USA and China. So we are not sure whether we're going to call North Korea as nuclearized yet. If that is the common understanding among three countries, that will be the possibility for them to find a chance to cooperate. I totally agree with your comment about China, but strategically, I'm not sure if what phrases are used, but one thing, what Obama had administration had done and what the Biden administration will do for North Korea should be separated. First of all, the Obama administration asked for North Korea to act first and they argue for nothing for nothing. If North Korea didn't make any behavior, then the USA won't make any action. And the third is wait and see. They will keep until North Korea makes some action. That's the, some basic foundation for the Obama administration. We can call it a strategic patience or some other praises. But the thing is that the key frame is nothing for nothing under the Obama administration. But luckily, the Biden administration is kind of doing something in the middle. That means they're gonna do something. I think that is very important Ton. As Mr. Januchi mentioned that he called Obama administration policy as a passive. 
but do something in the middle is not passive a little bit active from the perspective the doing something in the middle is giving a little spaces for us to expect something more than what happened in the Obama administration. The second point is really important. In Korea, arms control, uh, Koreans uh, refrain themselves from using the expressions of arms control. But if you read an article published by 30th of April, Washington Post, denuclearization is the ultimate goal of the Biden administration. They don't deal with the denuclearization at first, but they will deal with the denuclearization at the, as the last stage. I think that is the biggest change with this new administration in the States. The conservative government always talked about denuclearization. North Korea should denuclearize first and open up their uh, economic gate. Then we help them to achieve third, uh, make them rich. That was the policy. North Korea should make an action first. That's the big umbrella. But in the Biden administration, I think they have kind of, a, we can make an action together. So the praises of the do something middle means that North and US will take an action simultaneously. If that's the case, I think we can resolve many issues. So, uh, so far the conservative government ask North Korea to make an action first. If we give up on that and just to start to something else, and we can just put a denuclearization at the last stage. In the process, we can have the de declaration of the end of the war and we can provide humanitarian aid or whatever else. This is real kind of trade-offs. So this type of developments in the Biden, Obama, Biden administration is really welcoming and that is biggest difference from the Obama administration. That is not my word, but some other experts word written in Washington Post. So <laughs> that article, and if we have some policies from the US, which is similar to that article described, then everything will be more easily dealt with. Otherwise, situation gets worse. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, we have only 10 minutes left and let me uh, 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 open it up for a Q&A session. We already have almost 30 questions uh, and uh, you know, technically 10 minutes so won't be enough uh, to address all the questions. But the good news is we already, uh, I think, uh, addressed uh, uh, many questions uh, posted uh, in the Q&A box. So uh, I think uh, one of the questions that we haven't addressed so far is the trilateral uh, relations. So I have a question from Joseph E, Associate Professor of Hanyang University. His question is, how does South Korea-Japan relations, uh, for example, recent historical disputes affect us rock DPRK relations? Well, I, I don't want to be the only one who jumps in, but... Um, <laughs> um, I, as I, I mentioned uh, at, at, at when in my my earlier remarks, 제가 맨 처음에 말씀 처음에 말씀 드렸을 때 잠깐 언급을 하긴 아 죄송. I was waiting for the interpreter there. She was making me sound better than I do in English. Um, but no, I, I, I the Biden administration is attaching a great deal of importance to this notion that uh, South Korea, Japan, and the United States need to work together trilaterally. For not only for deterrence, but but in order to find a way to deal with a whole range of, of issues, security, economic, peace issues, denuclearization issues in Northeast Asia. 
So the fact that there is this continuing uh, uh, chill, <laughs> even maybe almost freeze between Seoul and Tokyo uh, is a source of great, I would say, frustration and even annoyance uh, to, to many in, the, many in, in Washington. Uh, it's also just a fact that, that uh, Japanese views uh, carry a lot of weight uh, in Washington. Uh, and uh, when, when Washington is hearing kind of one thing from Tokyo and another thing from Seoul, and there's a sense that they, they don't have, they, they, they can't coordinate these positions. I think it just adds to, uh, as I said, the sense that um, uh, forging a, a really useful policy is going to be very difficult. I'm, <laughs> so I'm trying to be somewhat diplomatic here. So someone can jump in and uh, be a little bit less, but I think, I think it's, uh, it, it does really influence the way that the policy process works in Washington. Thank you. Anybody with a little bit uh, less diplomatic response? Well, well, when it comes to the relationship between Korea and Japan, then, uh, th 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 then of course, uh, we, 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 all, we are always under the impression that we are entering into a very, very sophisticated and even, even dangerous, dangerous area. So, so every, everybody becomes cautious about it. But there is one, uh, one episode, one anecdote, which always com comes up in my mind when I think about the historical issues between Korea and Japan. Th that happened when President Obama came to visit Korea, that was in uh, April 2014. And then after the meeting with President Park geun -hye, then uh, there was a press conference. And then this question came up, and then that was about the comfort women. And the way President Obama addressed the, que addressed the question, it was very impressive. She, he, what, what he said was that, well, it in fact was terrible. And then it was egregious. Even if it happened during the time of war, it was shocking. And then he went on saying, well, well Prime Minister Abe would agree with me that when it comes to issue, issue, issue of history, we must begin by accepting fact as a fact. And, I, and, and, and then he just went on by saying, but at the same time, I hope that Koreans would understand that there are so many important issues between Korea and Japan that they just look ahead. So I was just listening to him, President Obama, and I was quite impressed about his deep understanding of these historical issues between Korea and Japan, but at the same time, the balance with which he was, he was approaching this issue. So on the one hand, he knew why South Korea, and then for that matter, United States as well, should be firm when it comes to, say, correct understanding of issue of history. But at the same time, he was just trying to put in, in wider perspective and then saying, well, this in fact is how we should be up, uh, approaching issue of history. But at the same time, we in fact must be mature enough to put in in wider perspective. So that, in fact, is the reason why I was so impressed with, uh, with the comment coming from President Obama and why I still remember that, uh, remember that comment. These days, again, and then, and then for the past four years, then I don't remember any, say, say similar anecdote, uh, not, not in, my, not in my, my, my memory. But these days, then, uh, for example, say, uh, Tony Blinken came to visit Korea. He, he came to visit Japan and then, and then he came to visit, visit Korea. When he came to visit Korea, I mean, Tony Blinken, when he came to visit Korea, he said, you know, press conference, he said, well, I hope Koreans understand. Korea is the first country I'm coming to visit as a secretary of state. That's what he said, Tony Blinken said, which reminded me of the time when Tony Blinken was appointed as deputy secretary of state. Uh, that was uh, 2015, February 2015. The first country he came to visit, uh, visit as, a, as a deputy secretary of state again was Korea. So that, that in fact was something which came up in my mind. In that press conference, 
Tony Blinken, I mean, when he came as a Secretary of State, he had to face the same question. There was a question being raised on comfort women issue. I was, I was listening, listening to him. And then he said, well, it was an egregious issue. Egregious, egregious. I, I mean, he, he again used that, uh, that uh, Obama terminology of egregious. And he I, he, I think, did exactly the same thing. He said, well, well, egregious as it is, well, we, in fact, must be, be able to put it in wider perspective. That, I think, is, uh, is a very important role, which, in fact, could be played by the United, in, by the United States. Trying to, uh, trying to put issues of history in the right perspective, but at the same time, continue to encourage Korea, continue to encourage Japan to think about the wider strategic interest we share between Korea, Korea and, and, and Japan and the United States. Thank you, Ambassador An. Uh, let me uh, bring up a couple of uh, questions about uh, North Korea's human rights issues before we conclude. We have a couple of minutes left. So um, I have a question from James Pristop, a senior fellow at National Defense University. His question is, how will Biden's focus on human rights impact US and Moon's engagement with North Korea? And related to that, I have another question from Im Bum Chun. Uh, what is Washington's reaction towards the South Korean law banning balloons to North Korea? 저는 아까 제가 말씀드렸지만 북한의 인권 문제는 As I mentioned earlier, 어, 북한 주민들의 인권을 실질적으로 개선시키는 것에 should be improved at the residence level. The, what I mean is that the human rights should be improved for the resident the average people. So we have to turn our eyes how we form the basket. Actually, if that happens, then we don't need to be, con we don't need to make it controversial because we are more likely to improve their living standards like uh, quarantine or disease control. And so we want to expand our horizon related to the human issues. Secondly, and North Korean defectors and many others, and you ask about some laws related to the defectors as uh, Professor Yeon Chul Kim mentioned before, and stopping uh, ballooning, preventing the ballooning is established and uh, enforced to protect people living in the border villages. To keep them safe and healthy, we have to have that law and we have to protect law. If you have that perspective, then it will not be problematic anymore. Uh, let me add one thing. Uh, for the China, uh, for the Japan, there was some questions about Japan. Uh, one question is about if Japan is a kind of obstacle to out of, uh, the North Korea and US relations. CVID is North, China's, uh, Japan's policy, North Korea. So uh, against that backdrop, that question comes from my guests. The CVID is not used in the Biden administration and the Biden administration use denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So it set Biden administration apart from the Ob Obama administration. I don't think that will be an issue, but still the differences of expression can originate from policies, but we shouldn't have that. That means we have to have a coordinated North Korea policies between three countries. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, 가지만, uh, 
Biden 정부가 Let me add one thing. Related to the human rights issue of North Korea, we have to consider humanitarian approach and human rights approach together. I think there is a very favorable approach. So in the process of election of United States, they talked about the reunion of dispersed families of Korean Peninsula. That was kind of one agenda of Biden uh, administration. And many people say that, many people wonder the relations between human rights and uh, North Korea nuclear weapons. If North Korea want to keep their nuclear weapons, then they have to strengthen their control domestically. That means their human rights situation will be worsened and deteriorated. So the process to deal with the nuclearization of North Korea should go in a way to open up, open up their gates. That means when it comes to North Korean human rights issue, we should avoid to have ideological approach or political approach that both of them are not favorable. Instead, we have to have a very tangible way to improve the actual human rights in North Korea. Thank you. Uh, we are a little bit over time, but I wonder if there's uh, uh, any uh, uh, American uh, speakers uh, who want to give us the last word. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's the last word, but just on, on the last question, the last question um, and to respond to, I think, General Chen's question. Celeste Ellington is in the same way. One second. Uh, the translation, Simon's translation. Yeah, OK. Korean translation, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Please go ahead. The, the, the leafleting law, I mean, my impression, and others uh, on the call have been in Washington, my impression is, is that uh, the, the leaflet law has been uh, seen uh, in the United States uh, uh, to the extent that people know about it, and, and there's, there's been quite a bit of talk about it in Washington and people active on it, has been seen as, as you know, why stop information from getting to North Koreans? And you know that that's uh, and and that's very understandable. I mean, I, I personally think, yeah, we should be trying to get information out, get get information in, get information out, get people in and out. We want that kind of openness. I think that some of the points that we've heard on this call of why the leaflets uh, have some downsides to them, uh, why why there are rational, there are good reasons to try to uh, have some controls on that. Are, are less well understood uh, in Washington. And, and still, even if they were heard, they might not be agreed with, but I think that that side of it is, 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 has gotten less attention. Um, with respect to, to human rights and the Biden administration, uh, the indications seem to be that, uh, uh, that the Biden administration will appoint uh, an envoy to the uh, position that was established by Congress uh, during the Bush, second Bush administration in the mid 2000s uh, on, on human rights. And, uh, but my expectation is that they will, I, I don't know who they will appoint, but that they will appoint someone who will, who will take the approach that has been mentioned earlier, that will look at this in a, in a practical uh, humanitarian and human rights oriented way uh, and uh, try to be a responsible voice. And I think the problem sometimes with human rights is, is uh, as seen by, well, certainly by, by North Korea as it was, and sometimes I think by people uh, here is, is it was, it was kind of a, another word for regime change. And however one feel, may feel about the regime, if we're going to have negotiations with them, I think we need to make clear that we can have a, a human rights and humanitarian dialogue um, that is not specifically pointed at a, a demand for regime uh, or, well, change in practices, but not change in, uh, in, the, in the regime itself. If, just to underscore the importance of this point that Ambassador Stevens has made, it was Senator Biden himself who authored the legislation that created the human rights envoy position in North Korea. I know because I wrote the legislation myself. And um, the purpose was not to use human rights as a bludgeon. It was not to use human rights as a weapon against North Korea. It was to engage with the North Korean government 
uh, on the serious human rights conditions in North Korea. When I was at Amnesty International, I helped to support the Commission of Inquiry's work uh, investigating the human rights uh, uh, crimes against humanity inside North Korea. It's a very serious problem. We have to work on it. It's really hard to work on it. It's really difficult to make progress, uh, but it's the job of diplomats to turn the impossible into the unlikely. Um, and, and human rights has to be a part of the US approach, but not as a weapon, uh, but, but as a genuine uh, interest of the American people, the Korean people, uh, to improve the quality of life for the people of Korea, North and South. Uh, and if we approach it with that attitude, with that taidu, uh, as the Chinese would say, I think there's a similar Korean word, maybe taido, uh, but this attitude is very important. Uh, to whether or not you can make any progress uh, on these really difficult human rights issues. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I, I wish we have a, another hour to uh, you know, continue our discussion, but we have a run out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank all the distinguished speakers for joining us today, especially our Korean speakers, uh, for staying up late at night for us. I think it's already past midnight in Korea, and hopefully you will have a good night's sleep there. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank our technical team for putting this together, uh, Mr. Uh, Junho Lee and uh, Ms. Ki Yun Sung for their excellent simultaneous interpretations. And of course, thank you all for joining us. And with that, uh, let me conclude today's webinar. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.